Alright, hello and welcome back to The Greatest Attorney Chronicles. Tonight we're going to be picking up the courtroom case from where I last left off, and hopefully this time I can figure out exactly what the problem was, I suppose. I guess I was too tired last night. Probably not helping, I'm getting a late start tonight, but oh well, that's how it is sometimes. The actual cause of death was... Alright, we're going to go from the start here, see what we get here from Dr. Scythe here. It all began when I saw the waxwork and the note tucked into its jacket. Alright, so from what you described before, it sounded like the note was anonymous. Do you have any idea of who was behind it? There are very few people in the know what really happened ten years ago to start with. But anyway, I've never heard of this engineer, so no, I had no idea. Yet, despite not knowing who was behind the plan, you went along with it? I had no choice. Protecting the professor's secret was my only concern. But the horse has bolted now. And the, st and the stable door will not shut again. It will never shut again. Sultan Yard's reputation will be immeasurably damaged as a result of all of this. Yes, thank you, Lord Van Zykes. I am well aware of that. So I as understand it, when you, when you found the bird cage, what you found in the bat cage was the waxed model. When then was the victim's body? The actual body of the victim, as indicated in the notes instructions, was beneath Holy! the experimentation stage. So you knew about the special construction of the stage used to carry out the trick then. It was quite obvious what happened when, with the victim and the waxwork. And you switched the two over, uh, didn't you? In other words, you recorded the victim's body as being discovered at the Crystal Tower. Waxwork? I wrapped it and sent it by carriage at the specified address at the specified time. Why were you given such directions? Presumably so that it could be recovered by Dr. Dr. Drebber and returned to the Madame Tuspels. Oh, I see. And then you put the birdcage back at the experimentation stage. Yes, although someone obviously made a mistake about which cage should go where. I thought I'd made it perfectly clear with the team, but still. And I suppose you were focused on the victim's body, that being a more important detail. Yeah, most likely. The body had to be arranged in certain ways to implicate the defendant, which is my job. The actual cause of death was the neck trouble. In the interesting implication here, the fact that the two I have to choose from to find the contradiction here. It's the one where she claims that she plunged into the screwdriver into his already dead body, or from the actual cause of death being the neck trauma. Uh, both of the fact one of these two has to be gives the rather disturbing implication implication that we need to prove that Dr. Scythe was the murderer, not the engineer, Mr. Drebber, like we originally had thought. Wait, why am I calling him Dr. Drebber? The whole reason he killed the murder victim here was... The whole reason the victim here is dead is because he wanted to get back the person who ruined his entire life. Mm. Hold it! You're quite sure of that, as it was a result of a broken neck. Yes, as a professional, that was more than apparent. You never know just by looking at the photograph of the victim, wouldn't you? Yeah. No, that's very true. Obviously not. Which is precisely why coroners are needed to determine these facts. Yes, assuming this one can be trusted. There's no point in calling an assessment to question without evidence. Let's get back to the testimony. Very well. I enlisted the help of the entire forensic team to address the scene appropriately. The truth is a state secret the highest level I have to protect it. Now, the thing I had issue with last night was that all of these are completely unrelated. I need... Actually, since this one was specifically what I was trying to address things with, it didn't work. I tried bringing up the... Actually, rather than try and find one which can contradict, maybe I should go the opposite and mark off the ones I know cannot be the case. Uh, the newspaper for the Great Exhibition, this has already given us all the information it can, I think. The crossbow, I think, has also given all information it possibly can. We already know what it was used for, why it was left at the scene where it was. The experiment sketch, again, this has taught us everything we needed to know. We can't do anything more any with it anymore. A piece of green cloth, again, this per served its purpose. It proved that there was an additional balloon that wasn't supposed to be there, or, and what had happened to it. I'm thinking the photograph of the victim might matter, but like she said, there's no possible way to tell his neck had been broken simply by looking at a photo. All we can see is here, and while there's obviously a drip here, this is, as you can see with the curve of his uh, chest, just, uh, dang, those are some massive pecs. But yeah, you can tell that this is fully consistent with the shape of his chest, so it would make sense to do that. I have the feeling this might be part of it, so we'll put this as the maybe pile. The autopsy report, we know this is completely bunk, so we have to not count it. Likewise, the screwdriver, I'm pretty sure we can... So, 
this is gone, this is gone. Uh, maybe. This is gone, this is gone, this is gone. Photograph. I think we've learned everything here we can. Uh, we can't even see his chest to see if he was stabbed here. Mm, we'll have this as a maybe. The birdcage has taught us everything we can, I think. I tried to show it on both last time, but it didn't, wasn't accepted. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to, I'll put this as a maybe, but I'm pretty sure this is gone. The photograph of Drebber here wasn't purely to be used during the investigation stage. I don't think it has anything it can help us with anymore. The camera, I think we've already used, we've already gotten all the information from since so we don't need any more. Piece of broken glass, again, we've gotten everything. We can mark these two off. Science trophy, um, yeah, we can mark this one off completely as well. Max Rocad, yeah, there's no way this is going to matter. We'll probably need the aut killer's autopsy report and the 10-year-old uh, article later, or I think, because the direction this is going, we're going to have to be opening the Pandora's box, as Zbarak von Zykes warned us. Post-explosion photograph, we clearly already have everything we need from it, so I think we can mark this off. Likewise, Drebber's contract was just here to establish that Odiasmin is the same person as the Odiasmin that did this article, so again, we can mark these two off for good, I think. I don't, we shouldn't need them anymore. The body could be arranged certain ways to make the defendant. That was my job. Alright, so you mean what you did with this, correct? I was merely carrying out the engineer's instructions. It was his words. Fabricate some evidence to make it clear Hairbrain alone could have killed Asmund. And there you went without any of your team to where Asmund fallen. That's right, yes. I leaned over the birdcage and opened it up. Then I took the screwdriver in both hands and plunged to the man's chest. After that, it was a simply a matter of recording the stab wound as the cause of death and not the autopsy report. The real cause of death being the fall, of course. I'm sure there's something here in this testimony. You know, if you think it would be appropriate, I'm sure you could ask Dr. Scyther to change the supplementary testimony. Uh, have her change it, yeah. We'll have her change it to the other one then, because last night I was so focused on it. I was focused on the other one for over half an hour. Yeah, the experiment sketch shows that she's would have been in this area beneath with the corpse. So of this is only this one, this one, this maybe this one, or this one. So there's, we're lowering it down. I really do think the photo is a big thing, but like I said, you can see here that the blood stain is completely matching up to the shape of his chest. So it can't prove. It doesn't necessarily prove he was. Was, uh, lo he was facing upward when it was the stab occurred. So I'm not sure where to go from here, I'm gonna be honest. Hmm. Well, after re I'm probably gonna be doing a lot of quitting and reloading, I'm gonna be blunt here. The fact I only have one penalty left means I'm gonna be making a lot of mistakes. Wait, this was it? Uh, this I gotta hear here. I've got a nasty feeling. That this inconsistency points to an extremely uncomfortable truth. Yeah, that's what I thought. But as I mentioned, the fact that those two specifically are being added implies that I need to contradict one of. I need to point out a contradiction in one of those, and that carries the unfortunate implication that she's much more responsible for his death than Mr. Drebber. What on earth is the matter, Council? Have you lost your tongue? I apologize, my lord. Uh, Dr. Scythe, in the last statement of yours, there's just one point. That seems to defy explanation. Out with it, my learned friend. Well, there was an obvious inconsistency between your description and this photograph. I'm gonna be completely blunt with everyone. I can only guess to that photograph because it was the first one that I felt was a maybe. Out of the... after eliminating all the ones that couldn't possibly be relevant. Alright, which shows the victim in the birdcage and the events following his death. The court has already examined that photograph and there is nothing new we can learn from it. Yes, we have already considered it, that's true. But we now know the fact to be different. What do you mean? I believe we should let the defense explain. Where in this photograph will we see the alleged inconsistency with the witness's statement? I'm pretty sure the stain there is what it's after. 
Look closely at the blood stain on the victim's chest. It clearly extends downwards in a direction towards the man's feet. And why is that significant, counsel? Yeah, I did look it up after I was confused last time, and if you stab someone who's already dead, the blood does indeed continue falling. So, yeah, the forensic sense would there, but... If the victim was stabbed moments before the kinesis machine was set in motion, that's entirely expected. Ah! Oh, of course! No, that's not what happened. Exactly, my lord. Dr. Scythe made it very clear in her testimony just now. The point at which she stole Professor Hairbrain's screwdriver and stabbed the victim... ...was after the grand deception was set in motion, when the birdcage had fallen below the stage and was out of sight. And from the shape of it, it's clear that the birdcage would have fallen on its side after a 30-foot drop. And if the victim really had been stabbed while inside that position... ...the blood from the wound would have spread out equally in all directions. Wait, really? I mean, we can see he, the dude's massive pecs lead downward to his... Okay, yeah, I'm gonna be honest. This might be legitimate and I just didn't think about it or I overthought it. But, yeah, I genuinely was just guessing this one. Alright, for it to have formed longitudinal appearance with like, his picture is inconceivable. Alright, given the victim's blood seeped vertically downwards from the wound, it must be the case that when you stabbed Mr. Asman, he was standing up. In short, Dr. Scythe, your latest testimony was a total fabrication. Ah. I knew it, I was right. Now I've identified the contradiction, there's only one way to explain the facts. We've all been under a great misapprehension here. What? What sort of misapprehension? Dr. Scythe. You claim you were coerced into helping Mr. Drebber and as a result of the note he left in the waxwork. You claim you made changes to the scene of the crime to implicate the defendant. And you claim you authored a fake autopsy report to cover your tracks. But one of those claims is an out and out lie. Because the question of what the bloodstain really tells us is only one possible answer. If that is the case, what is it, man? What is it? Counsel, you've clearly struck upon a revelation. Now tell the court what it is. Which part of Dr. Sight's story is shown to be a lie with the contradiction of the... her own testimony? Court record. First of all, we're gonna have to save because again, we only have one chance at this. So if I screw it up, I have to try again. Stabbing of the victim is the part that's wrong. The answer is very simple, if you consider the sequence of events. If, when the victim was stabbed, the blood from the wound seeped downward as it did here, you can be sure the victim must have been either sitting or standing upright at the time. But as you rightfully pointed out, the birdcage would have fallen outside when it fell beneath the stage. Yes, it would, which tells us the victim must have been in that position of his own accord. Oh, that's impossible, the man was dead, remember. No, that's the misapprehension. He survived the fall? When the bird cage fell from the stage in the void below, it must have hit the ground with considerable force. <gasps> yeah. Of course, because it fell a little feet first. But Mr. Asman didn't die in the fall. He probably lost consciousness for a while, but when he came around, he got it to his feet to climb out of the cage. Just as Dr. Scythe appeared. And I'm assuming her name is pronounced Scythe and not Sith. Largely because that would be kind of like a Reaper's Scythe, which would fit with the fact that she's the coroner. If the victim was in fact alive at that point in time, it changes everything. That would mean she murdered someone. Murdered him. Uh. Uh oh. Mr. Odie Asman's killer wasn't the defendant, Professor Albert Harebrain, nor was it the mastermind behind the stage trickery, Mr. Enoch Drebber. 
It was you, Dr. Courtney Sight. <laughs> order, order! Can, can this possibly be true? Have you been taking me for a fool? It was you, was it? You killed him. You hoped it by admitting to be an accomplice in Dr. Drebber's scheme the trial would end, before you were accused of a far worse crime. Cold-blooded murder. Oh, do shut up! You're so desperate now, you're making all this up! As if I would do something like that! Objection. I assure you, the defense is not desperate, Doctor. Mr. Naruto has already established the facts using evidence and logic alone. Ha! Huh. Logic, don't make me laugh! Sadly, your logic has a gaping hole in it. What? What do you mean? I thought it was obvious. A motive, boy. You're lacking a motive. What possible reason would I have to kill Mr. Asman? Asman was involved in any number of criminal activities, from coercion to theft to murder. But there's no known connection to Dr. Sight here. Hmm. I'm relieved to say it does seem somewhat far-fetched. True, there's no obvious motive, but there's still something in the back of my mind. I feel sure I've seen something somewhere that hints at why the coroner might have done this. Yes, I might have tampered with the crime scene and concocted a fake report. But murdering someone for no reason is a very different okay. story. No. When you question what possible reason you could have for wanting to kill Mr. Asmund, something did come to mind. What? What is it, Counsel? Enlighten the court at once! Yes, we saw it yesterday, didn't we? Something that seemed strange. We had no reason to suspect it at the time. There's a particular object that explains why Dr. Scythe would have wanted to kill Mr. Asman. Scalpels. True, we never understand the... And nor do we understand the Iron Mask. Oh, because he knew about the Iron Mask, perhaps? It's the Iron Mask. You've lost me. Huh? Um, sorry, Mr. Naruto, but why would the Iron Mask... Well, of all the things I saw yesterday, it definitely had the greatest impression. Clearly, you have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so it is the scalpels. I guess I must have said the wrong thing. Forgive the interruption, Dr. Scythe, but what my colleague meant to say was the scalpels. Perhaps that makes a little more sense to you? Ah, of course. Oh, I do like that she was the one who brought up. I was wondering why you had over 50 scalpels. After all, how could they be going through so many? It would appear that word has struck a chord, Doctor. You, come on, out with it. It was yesterday, after we visited your laboratory. Look this big, thick book here. Ah, it appears to be an accounting ledger. It's record of forensic investigation team spending, I think. Uh, what is it? It's clear the team put purchases, various equipment and supplies on a monthly basis, but... Well, one entry seems rather strange. Really, in what way? They're buying 500 scalpels every month. Five hundred scalpels? A month! At first, I wondered what on earth you could be using that many scalpels for. But actually, I realize now it's not the scalpels themselves that are significant. It's the money for them, disappearing every month in the department's accounts. Asma's criminal organization relied heavily on extortion for its funding, tracing money from the forensic investigation team's account to find where it's going. Would be extremely straightforward. So he's been blackmailing her the entire time, and she's been disguising it as a scalpel. Ten years ago, when Mr. Asma was still a journalist and wrote this article about Mr. Drebber, he may well have stumbled upon information as he was researching the story. Information relating to Dr. Scythe's darkest secret that he would use to rack money from her for the next decade. A darkest secret? Oh goodness, you mean... I don't know what happened on the night of that execution ten years ago, but clearly the opportunity to rid yourself of that menace was too tempting to pass up. So in the end, 
You weren't coerced at all, were you? You did it entirely of your own free will. You stabbed Mr. Asmund in the heart with all your might. To silence the blackmailer who knew your dark secret forever. You'll never understand, none of you. What we've had to keep covered up all these long years. As very little machine remains after it was ripped apart by the explosive, the truth of this case will never be properly established unless you speak out. And if you decide not to, it's very possible that Courtney Scythe will escape punishment for her crimes. Please, sir, own up to what you've done. Tell the court the truth of what happened. Ten years ago, you told the truth, and you were robbed of a bright and successful future as a result. I can certainly understand your bitterness and your consternation now. However, this is surely the chance you've been waiting for, to sever the hold that fate's had over you all these years. Super high voltage instantaneous kinesis? I mean, really. Alright, I was giving him a more of a rob robotic voice, since he's clockwork acting like a clockwork. It is an addle-brained mock scientist that are the worst you know. They don't recognize the fact they don't have talent. They can't even get that right. So they end up chasing impossible dreams, having unbridled faith in their abilities. They go on and on about their wonderful hypotheses, their stupid eyes shining like a child's. They make me sick. I cannot abide their foolishness. Careful, Mr. Dreva. I was particularly pleased with the Kinesis machine. It made for quite the show, didn't it? So you admit it. You admit that it was nothing more than a sham made for the purpose of killing the victim. Yes, I admit it. I did it all in the name of revenge. Revenge for the future that Mr. Asmund article had deprived you of ten years earlier. But the revenge you sought didn't stop at Asmund, did you? Did it? Which is where that particular wax word comes in. Yes, I see. The condemned convict you saw rising from the grave ten years ago. If your account of those events was all true... Then obviously Scotland Yard couldn't afford to acknowledge what had happened. Even if it meant discrediting a bright young man and crushing any future career he might have had. So your plan required that you abduct that particular waxwork model in order to exact your revenge on Scotland Yard as well. Or on Dr. Scythe, to be more precise. It was a year ago, by some extraordinary twist of fate, Asmund turned up at my workshop. He did not remember who I was, of course, he just wanted to employ my services as an engineer. And he happened to have a paper with him, an article on the front page which caught my eye about the coroner who'd handled the, that bogus autopsy being appointed to head of the new forensic team. When I learned that news, my cognitive processes started to devise a plan. What a horrid tale! He robbed me of my future, so I wanted to use the man's own wiles against him for revenge, and have that rotten Scotland Yard eating out of my hand at the same time. I wanted them all to suffer the humiliation I had to suffer. Yeah, this is the second case already that we've where the entire thing was obscured because of state secrets. <laughs> your actions against those who'd ruined your future were justified as revenge, at least to yourself. Certainly, no one has the right to destroy another's prospects, especially for purely selfish gain. And yet, in carrying out your plan, you did exactly that to someone else, didn't you? Did I? Professor Harebrain's only crime was passion for his hypothesis. He had no com function about sacrificing his future to effort to affect your revenge. You knew that he would be ever forever branded a failure and a fraud. 
Perhaps life treated you unfairly ten years ago, and others' misconduct left your life in tatters. But remember this. Your own actions resulted in exactly the same thing for another perfectly innocent young man. I... I... Lord Van Zykes, what of Dr. Scythe? An immediate warrant for her arrest has been granted and she has been remanded in custody, my lord. I presume she will face trial in the coming days along with Mr. Drebber. A most regrettable situation indeed. She's made great contributions to her profession over the years. It really is a hard truth to swallow. However, this is a topic for some future occasion. For now, Professor Hairbrain. Oh, um, um, yes. It seems there was a great deal more to your experiment than you realized. However, I think we can assume now that all the sort of details have been brought to light. This has been a very long and profound trial, but I'm pleased to say you are absolved of all guilt. This whole experience has taught me a very great but painful lesson. I've, I've been, I mean me, this dedicated scientist, this devotee of natural philosophy. I've been selfish and self-centered, and above all, a fool. Professor. I have spent my life thinking of nothing but my research. Misguidedly believing that whatever I do, I can set whatever I set my mind to, I can do whatever I set my mind to, despite my lack of talent. And the worst of it is, in the process, I have caused others pain and misery. Others who are far, far greater people than I. No, Professor. That is not true. What? Don't tar yourself with the same brush as Drebber. What happened was his doing and his alone. This outcome is his fate, not yours. You're not to blame in any way. Yeah, the thing about the first case we go up against Von Zykes in the first game, the fact is with Miss Gilded, someone who is clearly corrupt and basically got himself to do this. This was obvious. The fact that that was our first against Van Zyke, case against Von Zykes is no accident. He clearly was. They clearly wanted us to get a bad first impression to him, since, well, as far as he's concerned, we were just another defense lawyer trying to possibly corrupt, working with a corrupt man, and then not caring about the truth. But I'm, I'm imagining he's starting to change his opinion now because we. We asked the judge to throw out a not guilty verdict purely to get the full details of the case down here. And I'm hoping he'll turn his opinion on the Japanese people around by the end of this. It hasn't escaped my nose that quite a few people in London have been uh, quite, um, not particularly nice towards Japanese people. But, well, first of all, it makes sense given the time frame this game takes place, but. It's a. Uh, Hopefully, we can at least make Von Zykes soften up to us after a bit. After all, by doing this, we prove that we care about the truth just like he does. Alright, Lord Van Zykes. And the dis derision which he referred to you as earlier, calling a fool talentless even. The man has no idea. To believe in yourself and your work, your fingers to the bone to realize your dreams. That is laudable, not laughable. No one has the right to deride another for such choices. Oh. Uh, thank you, Barak. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury... Yes, Lord. Is this court's expectation to find the defendant not guilty of the charge which he stands accused? I presume there are no objections? Not for me, my lord. Certainly not. This trial has really made me think, but... This is the right decision. This is the but this is the right decision. It has been proven mathematically and rigorously. I have no misgivings whatsoever. Mm, what's that? He's done. I, it's, it's all over. I don't know what's become of the yard these days. I don't recognize the place. Very well. In that case, I hereby pronounce the defendant not guilty.
Court is adjourned. Phew. It's over. That was, uh, some trial. The 24th of October, 4.33 p.m. The Old Bailey. Defendant's antechamber. Professor, what a splendid outcome, isn't it? It is, it is. Congratulations, Professor Hairbrain. Mr. Naruhodo, Mr. Zotto. Truly, truly. Inside myself with gratitude. I could never thank you enough. I'm just glad it's all been cleared up. That you realize you were just caught up in a bad situation. Ah, uh, right now, you know, if I had the research grant money, ah, uh, I'd give a whole lot to you, every penny. Well, that's very kind, but I'm just a student, so... We don't need any financial reward. Your acquittal's more than enough. Oh, oh dear, what can, what can I do? How about this? As a memento, the paper about my hypothesis is inside. Well, just as a memento, then. Thank you. I've been wondering, Professor. What are you going to do now? Oh my, yes, uh, what am I going to do? My hypothesis and my great machine both lie in ruins. But still, it's been too long since I was last in London. Perhaps I'll enjoy some sightseeing. I'll enjoy some sightseeing. I must explore the great exhibition while I'm here as well. See if new inspiration hits me. Well, that's what happens. If one dream is complete or doesn't work out, you find a new one. I can't allow that. Oh, Von Zykes. Oh, Lo Von Zykes. What are you doing here? Oh, Barrack. I'm sorry you had to go through to that, Albert. Well, if I'm honest, it was terrifying. You were like a great demon behind your bench there, hurling down on your prey. <laughs> You're one of the few true friends I have. I wouldn't, couldn't leave it to anybody else to handle the prosecution or the defense. I'm sorry? Or the defense? Did I just hear that right? I always knew you had my best interests at heart, don't worry. Uh, how about you show me around while I'm here in town? It's been a long time since we left university. We have a lot to catch up on. Listen, Albert. In a few days, your acquittal will be made official. When that happens, you must head straight to Dover. I'll accompany you. From there, you'll cross the channel and make your way back to Germany. I've already purchased the tickets. Uh, but no, uh, hold on a minute, Barrack. What about the Great Exhibition? This is the chance of a lifetime for me. I want to look around. No, no. Sightseeing, Albert. Give on the idea. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see any warmth in those eyes, Barrack. Um, Lord Van Zykes. What's all this about? A necessary precaution. But yes, I think I understand. You do? Well, Iris told me when you met Lord Van Zykes' office some days ago, he asked how Mr. Natsume was doing. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so he knows that leaving the country makes them safe from his curse, and he doesn't want his friend to suffer it. I remember being surprised. I think it was nice to ask him. Well, the point is, Mr. Natsume is still alive and well. Even though it's been more than six months now since his tr he stood trial with the Reaper as a prosecutor. Ah, you mean the Reaper's influence doesn't stretch overseas. Those in the Reaper's sights meet their end days or sometimes months after their acquittal. That's been a pattern up until now. Oh, but of course, we know that both Mr. Natsume and Gina weren't completely innocent. That is true, and perhaps that governs and the Reaper's actions. The truly innocent are spared. But I don't want to take any chances with a close personal friend. Oh, Barrack. Like the mustache Japanese man, this man should leave the country without delay. That is why I'm packing him off to Germany at once. Listen. Right. Uh, does your friend Shape Package get any say in it? Oh goodness, was that your intention all along then, Lord Van Zykes? 
in court where people think of him as the Reaper. This man seems absolutely merciless. And yet, sometimes I feel as though I don't understand it all. Look. Yeah, I think he's not exactly a fan of his Reaper reputation, but he at least makes use of it while he has it. It is time to go out. Back to prison for the time being. Uh, yes, alright. Well then, Mr. Narahodo. Uh, thank you so much for everything. Oh, not all, Professor. It was a pleasure getting to know you. Best wishes, Professor Hairbrain. Well, once the dust has settled, you must come and visit me in Germany. Anyway, goodbye for now. <laughs> um, now, my Japanese friend. Oh, yes, uh, I thought you'd gone too. Oh, yeah. On that note, I am glad that Mr. Natsume ended up being not a filler character like I was worried. In fact, I think during the first trial of the last game, I commented that he pro we probably won't see him again. Well, I'm glad we did, even if it was just for a little bit. It's not a big deal. It, in fact, he's really just there to confirm that he's been doing well since he got back to Japan, but... It does make it feel like that case wasn't a filler at all. Although, granted, now that we know the second case he was involved in, that means it was actually a lot more plot-relevant than expected, especially now that we know that his room was hiding the collar of the dog that the professor used to murder people with. Oh yes, I thought you'd gone. We have matters to discuss. Can you spare me some time? Oh, you want to talk with me? Certainly. I'll be waiting in the courtroom in ten minutes. Well, that was strange. Uh, for some reason, I didn't get that sense of impending doom as he walked away this time. Alright, he's probably gonna tell us the truth behind... Yeah, the Enigma, Baron Von Zykes. What does he want to discuss, I wonder? The answer awaits in the courtroom, I suppose. Here goes, then. Hmm? Alright, the 24th of October. 4.58 p.m., almost 5. The old Bailey courtroom. Ah, uh, he's going to ask us to take the mask off. He feels now's a good time. So, are you satisfied? You saved a guileless scientist from a great justice. Um, yes, I think so. I'm relieved at least that the man's innocence could be proven. Anyway, I imagine you've been wondering uh, where my animosity towards you... Japanese comes from. Yeah, we need to ask him what the whole this is about. Well, at first I thought you just didn't like me. I imagine you saw me as a pretentious child from an unimportant land which had no business being here. But now I think differently. You clearly know our ways, so I would guess that some specific incident led to your thorough dislike of my race. Will you tell me what happened, please? Ooh, dog needs to be let out. Well, this'll- I'll let the tension rise a bit then. Alright, and we now finally get to learn the truth here. The Professor. I thought I'd never hear that name in this courtroom again, to be honest. He took your brother's life. Clint. My brother was Clint Von Zykes. Sixteen years ago, when I was still just in my teens, he was already... out, the other wants out as well, usually, I suppose. He was already the director of prosecutions and a key member of the judiciary. I looked up to him. He was everything I aspired to be. He was involved with the establishment of the justice systems in foreign countries as well. There were exchange programs between other Britons and other between Britain and other nations to share knowledge and ideas. As a part of one of those programs, 
three judicial students came to Britain from your homeland, the Empire of Japan. Oh, that was 16 years ago then. One of them could have been my father. Of course, I remember Dr. Mikotaba well. I had no I I had no idea. I was a minor at the time, training at the prosecutor's office. One day, Clint introduced me to three visiting Japanese. So, you've actually met my father. He and his colleagues were polite and amicable. They were adept at their work and exacting in their standards. It was my first encounter with the spirit, and it made a very a great impression on me. But six years later, that's when it happened. The investigation was going nowhere. There were no suspects, even. Just an ever-growing list of victims. And in the end, my brother became one of the... In fact, before the case was finally resolved... I'm sorry, Lord Van Zykes. Truly. Clint was always ready to put his life on the line for justice anyway. So he wouldn't have wanted it any other way. He lost his life to the killer, but it was his victory in the end. Oh, one needs back in. Give me a moment, please. Watching these dogs is a handful. Oh, here comes the other one I should have known. his victory in the end. For me personally, though, it was a great loss. I found myself in a very dark place indeed. When I finally found out the killer's identity, the reason why no one had been able to catch the man sooner ceased to be such a mystery. He had been hiding in plain sight all this time. In plain sight? Are you aware of political events t the political events ten years ago? It was a period of extremely sensitive diplomacy between the British and Japanese empires. A new treaty was being forged, I believe, yes. Correct. The Anglo-Japanese Treaty of Friendship and Navigation was being concluded. The leaders of both countries were deep in extensive political discussions. Which is why this particular killer's appearance in court was conducted as a closed trial. If the British public had known the identity of the killer, not only would the treaty have been in jeopardy, but our two nations could very well have ended up at war. What? A uh, war between Britain and Japan? But that would mean... Oh my, you mean to say the professor was... When the trial reached its conclusion earlier, I thought to myself, yes, it's time. Time for you to come face to face with this hideous monster. I borrowed the key for the mask from the proprietress of the Waxwork Museum. So see for yourselves now. Confirm it with your own eyes. The truth that's been hidden this past decade. You know it's a big deal when they make it. It's with voice acting, and I must say I really do like the models they have for this game. <gasps> the, that's the professor. Yes, that's him. Until now, a thought never even crossed my mind that the mass murderer, whose crimes shook Britain as never before. Was Japanese. Wait, wait a minute. That face. I feel as though I've seen it somewhere. It's strangely familiar. <laughs> Is your partner going Super Saiyan over there, Von Zykes? Father. 
Kazuma's what? father? Father? Yeah, we figured this out pretty early, but this just confirms it. Somehow Kazuma didn't Kazuma! die. My best friend, Kazuma Asogi. After a whole year, finally his memories return. As he stood there before me. did a good job on these models. They're very expressive. They really do feel... My friend. Kazuma-sama! Judicial Assistant Mikotoba. It's been a very long road. Thank you. Thank you for guiding my friend here when I could not. It... It was an honor. I knew you wouldn't die that easily. Cosmo. I owe you thanks, too. For taking good care of that in my absence. Hmm? Oh. Karuma. The great blade of the Asogi clan. Passed down through the generations. When we left Japan, this sword was at my friend's side. A Japanese man's katana is his soul, and he couldn't be parted from it. But then, when the incident happened, it was Susato-san's wish that I inherit the sword, and I've kept it with me ever since along with my memories of the friendship we shared. With this by my side, I always felt that you were watching over me somehow. at it but I still can't believe it this mass murderer is Kazuma's father Ryunosuke, we have much to talk about, but now is not the time. I'll be seeing you. That's all Kazuma said. Before he turned and left us there, in the courtroom. Was that his secret mission? To make up for her uh, what happened with his father? So he's the living afterimage of the man who took my brother's life, is he? Yes, Kazuma Sogi, my best friend. Three months ago, when Lord Strongheart introduced us, I had an inkling there was something there, some connection. 
Why did Lord Strongheart do that? Why did he make Cosmo Lanzike's apprentice? And when he was suffering amnesia at that, the man was apprehended, even executed. But his legacy won't die. That's the sad truth. Anyway, that's all I had to say. I thank you for meeting with me as I asked. Ten years ago, my grandmother took me to the railway station. It's there we were to meet my father from the train. For me. It was the first time I had ever seen him. Poor Suzato-san, all this time tied up with painful memories for her, too. She's never talked about this with me before, though. This explains why Sholmes had to make sure that Mikotab Professor Mikotaba got to look through that Hound of the Baskerville story, because that's the retelling of the, uh, uh, the Professor murders, and he needed to be sure that the others involved with the case approved of it. And when Mikotaba told him, or possibly someone else told him not to, he made it clear Iris wasn't to print it. it took time to adjust having to father, to having father around, and just as I was starting to get used to it, he called me into a study one day. He told me that a great friend of his had passed away in London, and that that friend had left behind a son, a boy seven years my senior. Father told me the boy had made a promise to his late father, so he was studying to become a defense lawyer. I wanted to help, so I studied to become a qualified judicial assistant. As I'm sure you've worked out, that young man's name was Kazuma Sogi. So you see, that's how he and I met. For a brief moment, my great friend had returned, only to disappear again all too soon. But in that fleeting encounter, something stirred. Something that had been dormant for a long time, as if great wheels had been set in motion. I could almost hear them creaking into life. In some ways, it was the end of a chapter, but in many, it was the start of a new one. Oh, these are all the start of a new one. Then again, that seems to be a uh, running theme here. Whenever something feels like it's reaching its conclusion, it's actually the start of something more. Twisted Karma and his last blow, and his last bow, episode 4. We're gonna go right in, I think. I've gotta be able to late start, but I won't get as far as I can. It was indeed the most bizarre incident born of a curious advertisement and a commonplace killing at the edge of a town. At the edge of town. Pipe in hand, Sholmes looked down at the thick, rolling fog outside our window. I wonder exactly how many mysteries are out there. Hidden within this bed of fog, he said. Indeed, a most bizarre incident, born of a curious advertisement. A hellhound's mad gallop through the shadows of a serial murder. An executed man's graveyard resurrection in the dead of night. And a commonplace killing in a small, forgotten room at the edge of town. There is, naturally, always another side to every case, of which most remain ignorant. And it is that other side which compels me to the scene of the crime, Wilson. So quickly now, take your hat and let's be on our way, my dear fellow. For our adventure is not over yet. Come! The game is afoot. If I remember right, the deer stalker being in Sherlock Holmes' hat is a actually a pop culture invention. It wasn't the case in the originals. Eight days after the earth-shattering trial and Cosmo regaining his memory, we were in the foyer of one of London's most luxurious hotels, the Great Waterloo Hotel.
Professor Mikataba is due to arrive at any moment. Yes, I'm so glad we got here in time. Suzato hasn't been the same since what happened. Not that I'm surprised. The truth about Cosmosom's father. Do you suppose my father knew? That he was actually the mass murderer of the professor, you mean? I knew that's what she was thinking about. There's a good chance, I'd say. I mean, they did come here to London together 16 years ago, didn't they? Yes, that's true. Come to think of it, didn't you say Professor Mikataba knew about Cosma going missing in Hong Kong as well? That's right, but for some reason he wasn't at liberty to talk with me about it. That probably means he knows, then, about Cosma showing up here in London with amnesia, and that he's regained his memory now. Ah, oh, there she is. Oh, Father! Hello, Suzano. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. We're delighted you've arrived safe and sound. Hello, Mr. Naruhodo. Very kind of you. Take the trouble to meet us here. Oh, not at all. It's my pleasure. Not all about your extraordinary exploits here in London. No, news has crossed the seas. It has? I always look forward to reading the monthly reports that arrive with the steamships from Britain. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you very much. Who is this man? Why do I feel as though I've seen him before? In the dig of her expression, you can't quite place me. Well, in that case, how about a little reminder? Is this your a firm tap should do it? Yes. Here we go then. I hereby pronounce the defendant Reynolds Genoroto. Guilty! Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, your. The Japanese judge. Court will now hear. Court will now hear the trial of Rhinosuke Norodo. Um, uh, your. Your Excellency. Hello, Judge Jigoku. How are you? It's been a long time. Ah! Good, you remember now. It really did the trick. The old day, ah. Only I was declared not guilty, wasn't I? And there was no laughing at the time. So long again after all this talk. After all this time, it's hard to believe it's been ten years. To be honest, I never thought I'd be back. Neither did I. I didn't imagine Japan would ever be invited to an international symposium like this. But really, I doubt anyone did, to be honest. It's all thanks to you, isn't it? Sesh, sesh. What are you talking about, Eugen? Ha 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 ha. Of course, Judge Jigoku, he must complete the set. He's the other man who, 16 years ago, came to London with Cosma's father, Professor Mikataba. He's the third of the visiting scholars. Well, all those passport checks and luggage searches the border took a lot, had a lot of time. I must say, I'm rather envious of your ministerial, st ministerial status. You didn't have to go through any of that, did you? Ah, I knew you were jealous. <laughs> I'm sorry, ministerial status? Uh, yes, didn't you know? Seishiro is also Japan's Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was his personal assistance that allowed you to take Cosma's place here on the study tour. Guilty as charged. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. He's really every bit as important as he looks. Ah, yes, no. Naruhodo, I received a telegram from Lord Strongheart yesterday. Oh, he did. It appears that some things came to light in a trial you were involved in eight days ago. About what happened ten years ago. That tragedy. Yes, could you please tell us any more about it? Well, let's start about your journey from Japan. Uh, how was the voyage here? Well, 50 days at sea is a very long time by anyone's standards. But it wasn't as bad when we first came 60 years ago. 16 years ago. No, that's true. Then I truly wondered if we wouldn't be drifting the vast ocean the rest of our lives. This time we followed the same route as you, so we were able to relax and enjoy the experience. Ah! So you stopped in France's beautiful capital, capital, Paris. We did, yes. Though only for one night. Yesterday evening, we left the port of Dunkirk for Dover. Just in time for the symposium, in fact. It starts tomorrow. 
I'm not very good at a grizzled man voice. It's wonderful you invited to attend such an important international event. I'm very proud of you, Father. Just thanks to Seshiro here, 16 years ago he managed to integrate himself with Britain's Attorney General. I'm sure that's why he was invited, and I suppose you could say I'm something of an appendage by default. Speak for yourself, Eugen. You are close friends with the Professor of Forensic Science at the Major Hospital. Yes, well, I'd rather not dredge all that up, really. Did he know Dr. Scythe? No, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, but it doesn't bring him back. Oh yeah, Cosmo's father, I suppose. We have to ask. The professor, the killer who took the lives of five members of the British aristocracy, it was actually Cosmo's father, wasn't he? That's correct. Genshin Asogi. Genshin. You knew, I presume, father? Yes, he was a close friend at the time. Genshin uh, came to Britain as a police detective. He was studying in investigative techniques at the Scotland Yard. They say he made a great impact. I've never understood what drove the man to commit such heinous acts. It was a closed trial, so the public never knew the truth. And he was executed with little ado. To this day, very few people know what really happened, even in our homeland. But what about Cosma? Did he know? Did he know the truth about his father? No, no, of course not. He was told his father passed from sickness. However, I suspect he may have had his doubts. Oh, why is that? As you know, I tried to guide Cosma growing up as if he were my own son. Then one day, he came to my office at the university and said, I've decided I want to travel to Great Britain to study there. Do, do you think he wanted to come here to investigate his father's death? I don't know. When I looked into his eyes, I did know there was no way I'd be able to stop him. Uh, something else came to light in the trial the other day, actually. Oh, what was that? Well, having disappeared in Hong Kong and been missing for almost a year, Cosmo has since turned up here in London, working as the apprentice of Lord Van Zykes. What? What? That's news to us! So, Lord Strongheart's telegram neglected to mention that part, then. As you know, we both thought Cosma had died on the steamship during our voyage to Great Britain in January. But he didn't die. He's alive. As you knew, didn't you, Father? In actual fact, no. What I did know is that when your ship docked in Hong Kong, he mysteriously vanished. We sent a team of investigators to Hong Kong to ascertain what happened, but to no avail. But he's still alive? Here in London, you say? I never dared even dream of it. Why on earth did the young man not make contact? The government police have been chasing clues fruitlessly for months now. Well, it seems that he was suffering from amnesia. What amnesia? When we first came across him here in London, he didn't know either who either of us were. Mm, I see. He only regained his memory eight days ago. This is unbelievable. Yes, it's quite miraculous. I wonder why Lord Strongheart didn't let us know. I must speak with him urgently. I wonder how Cosmo's been these past few days. Would it be wrong of us to go and visit him? Simon Britton. That began 16 years ago now. It's a distant memory, really. It was Eugen here, Genshi, Asogi, and myself. We were the original three. The first judicial scholars from Japan to travel overseas to study. Ocean voyages were not what they are today, I can tell you. 16 years ago, things were tough for their generation. Your father was an exceptionally fine medical student at Yuma University at the time, you know. Yes, grandmother told me. I went to do research at the Great London Hospital to study autopsy, practically unheard of in Japan. Yes. It was an eerie place, sandwiched between the back of a prison and the burial ground. Ah, uh, no more talking graves. Very often there's no one willing to deal with bodies following autopsy work. So you see, autopsy labs have something of an unavoidable relationship with graveyards and prisons. Not my cup of tea at all. Do you remember that Scottish prison governor? Uh, Caton his name was. He was a good man. Yes, but of course, in our sixth year here, everything changed with that 
dreadful case. When Genshin was arrested for a series of the most gruesome murders. I simply couldn't believe it. I'd known the man for years. I was a witness to the secret hearing and I tried to speak for his defense, but... You were, went a little too far and ended up facing charges yourself, didn't you? Well, suffice to say that after that trial, we were sent back to Japan. There was nothing more we could do to save Genshin. He was a lost cause, sadly. Well, if you'll excuse us now. Yes, uh, so I'd like to get this trunk up to my room as soon as possible. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have held you up there for so long. I'll call for the porter then. Just wait here. Suzato has gone off in a run. At a run. I'd like to stay and talk more, but I do have various preparations to make for tomorrow. Uh, yes, of course. It must be a big responsibility representing our entire country. I wish you the best of luck. Narahodo. I hope you'll keep an eye on Suzato for me. Keep looking after her, as you obviously have been. Oh, no, I mean, if anyone's looking after anyone, it's her looking after me. Well, I do appreciate you being there for her. After all, I've been a miserable father to her. I've thoroughly let her down. I was about to say, are you expecting to die or something? But, yeah, it's just that he admits he's been a pretty awful father. And he put his, uh, research study, the politics and all that before his family, and that's, uh... Yeah, she even admitted she was all... She was all... Only met him for the first time when he returned to Japan. I'm sorry, what do you mean? Well, it was 16 years ago when I started my long study tour in Britain, you know? The very year Suzato was born. Yeah, I'd heard. The growth of my daughter was the most joyous event of my life, but... Well, sadly, it was accompanied by the most tragic event of my life as well. Oh well, yeah, Suzato hinted at something like that. It was a rather turbulent time at home. Anyway, I won't bore you with the details. The point is, I became rather less dependable than befits a grown man. And it was that then that Seshiro offered me the opportunity to study here in Great Britain. I was too worried about you to leave you behind. So perhaps a little heavy-handed when it came to persuading you, perhaps a little heavy-handed when it came to persuading you to accompany him here in, me, here in London. So that's what happened in a nutshell. So that's the reason why I now feel compelled to give my daughter as many opportunities as I dare. Though the world does not readily afford young women such things, I must say. I completely understand, Professor. Uh, one other thing, Narahodo. If I may be so bold, I have a favor to ask you. Oh, really, of course. What can I do for you? Well, the thing is, I... I'm sorry that took so long. Oh, Mrs. Otto. Now then, allow us to take your bags. Allow me to take your bags. Uh, one moment, if you please, Porter. Uh, of course, sir. Uh, the machine around your neck, it's a camera, I believe. Oh, quite right, sir. Just five shillings for a lovely photograph to be made a wonderful stay at the hotel, sir. Well, I think given the occasion, we could justify the expense. Ah, uh, yes, of course. I'd like to thank you for coming with me, Mr. Narahodo. It's really made Father very happy, I think. Oh, well, I'm pleased then, but we were interrupted before. Mr. Mikotaba was about to ask me something. Shall we return to Baker Street, then? Well, unfortunately, I think we may know, may know our next murder victim. Except, except Iris will have some delicious tea waiting for us. Yes, let us go. I'm getting more and more anxious about Cosma, though. Perhaps I'll try to meet with Lord Strongheart later and ask after him. That desk is known as the Hotel Reception. Anyone wanting to spend the night here has to report there to sign in for their stay. Oh, do you think that's the head clerk behind the desk there? Yes, I'm sure it must be. I'd love to stay in a grand hotel like this for a little while, wouldn't you? Just to know what it's like. If the hotel fee was paid through our strip in, I'm afraid it might bankrupt our homeland. Uh, true, London gives the word expensive a whole new meaning. Look, these cases just left on the trolley. Aren't they worried about thieves? I know I am. Haven't you seen the porter over there? Don't worry, he's obviously keeping an eye on everything. Ah, 
So it's a trap designed to catch any chancers who might be tempted. Why did the porter give me such a scathing look just now, do you suppose? Well, some might say you look a little suspicious with your jet black clothes. Not everyone clad in black is some sort of ninja with intent to steal, you know. Ooh, chandelier. Have you seen all those sparkling jewels up there? They must have gathered every single gem in the world for that. Ah, uh, it's called a chandelier, I believe. It's designed to provide elegant lighting in large, spacious rooms such as this. So they had to gather every gem in the world just to illuminate one room? It's probably electric light bulbs that are actually throwing the light. If I tried to hang something like that from the ceiling in the office, it would be scraping on the floor. I think perhaps chandeliers aren't for you, Mr. Narahodo. Oh, whoops. Ooh, a painting. Look at that, it's a picture of the Crystal Tower. Well, the Great Exhibition is one of Britain's most prestigious achievements in recent years. I still wonder how tall it is. Does it really represent the pinnacle of scientific achievement in so many ways? There's a 20 meter tall chimney in a bathhouse near my lodgings at uh, Yuma University. The attendant there is always boasting it's the tallest object in the neighborhood. I'm sure. Did you know that over or the channel in Paris there's a tower that's 300 meters tall? Wait, what? How many times taller than the chimney? <laughs> yeah, Yume's Oak and Hot Springs. That. It's that tall. How does that drop properly? Smoke would get stuck, surely. I don't think it's that sort of tower, Mr. Narahodo. It's his mask. Sholmes is sweet. What's that? A man screaming in a most unflattering way. Do you think, uh, could it have been Mr. Sholmes? Oh my, I do hope not. Wee! I don't do it anymore. Wanna me, wanna me. This stop is this disgraceful display. Uh, who are these people? Look at their hair, it's bright red. I think, uh, they must be clients of Mr. Sholmes. Alright, you two, come in here with me now. Oh, down to the prison. No, not the prison. It's dark and damp, and I don't like it. Oh, the darkness, it is my friend. I'm not scared. Whee! But you are scared of the dark. Oh, shut your mouth, you idiot. I'll quietly in the dark and plan our next dairy heist. I don't like this. I don't like it. Well, we'll finish this down at the yard. Now get moving. Bye then, Genie. Have fun. Oh yeah, thanks, Iris. Thanks, you great detective. <laughs> Gina makes a fine detective herself, doesn't she? Oh, Susie and Runo. Hello, Iris. We're home. Well, did you find your daddy? Yes, we arrived at the hotel just before her, he and his friend. Oh, that's great news. Hope I'll get to see my daddy again soon. Uh, yes, of course. Dr. John H. Wilson. So, Iris, all that remains now is the greatest problems known to man. Wait, what? Before we concern ourselves with that, I believe some tea is in order, don't you, my dear fellows? Is something wrong, Mr. Narahodo? Do I have a crumb or such like on my face? Uh... Not so much on your face, as on your head, I'd say. Go on then, everyone. I've brewed a lovely special blend. Time for tea. Uh, whatever's going on here today? In that case, let us sit and drink now. For I am, in fact, expecting a guest later today. Alright, what does that other thing over here say? This blackboard is where Iris scribbles down her latest ideas, isn't it? Let's see. 
Oh, she seems to have drawn a lot of little slick figure, stick figures. Cheap apples the market is what all of them say. Well, the little figures can speak. All your questions would be answered if only you would read this month's Rants magazine. Tell me the one who can't make any sense of this. Uh, the great... Your two visitors there. Uh, Mr. Sholmes, who are those two gentlemen that were here before? Oh, just a pair of petty criminals. Nothing of significance. Of course, they have to make a living somehow. When the mood takes me, I'm willing to turn a blind eye to all manner of infractions. When the mood takes you? All manner of infractions. But... When such fellows set their sights on Mr. Hawk Sholmes, well, that's when their luck runs out. Oh my, you were the target of a crime, Mr. Sholmes? But I quickly devised a plan to entrap them and deliver them to our young detective ally. You should have asked Gregsy to come too. We could have had an arresting tea party. I did said word, but no answer was forthcoming. The man is consummately the wrong place at the wrong time. There's a word for it, I'm sure. Ah, I have it. A, a bungler. It's a good reason. It's a good job he's not here to hear. He's not here to hear you say that. So the redheads have been up to no good, eh? I wonder what the men did. Absolutely a reference to uh, another Sherlock Holmes book. But the more interesting thing here is how this is going to tie in the end. If it does to the case this time around, if it ever does. Alright, the greatest problem. Um, what was that about the greatest of problems known to man that you mentioned before? Is it another fiendishly intricate case, Mr. Sholmes? How would I best explain it? Are you aware of the theory of evolution by natural selection, perchance? Um, I think I've heard talk of it somewhere, possibly. It's a revolutionary scientific theory that was the newly, pro newly proposed 40 years ago now. According to its author, Mr. Darwin, we humans were once apes lived in the treetops. That's massively overly simplifying it, but... Uh, it would be way too long to explain the whole details behind that. Indeed, and from the very moment those apes descended from the canopy to live as humans. It's been our lot to be the mercy of the greatest problem known to man. Our lot? What is this great problem, Mr. Sholmes? Why, is it not obvious, my dear man? The problem of rent. Ha. <laughs> oh, but uh, did you not receive a rather large sum of money from Madame Two Spells the other day? A large sum? One potted herb for Iris, a new motor car for me later, and that's all that's quite disappeared, I assure you. Honestly, Hurley, you know you squandered it. Yes, well, anyway, uh, two days ago, I discovered the answer to man's greatest problem. For the coming month, at least. And what was the answer? Why, there is a substantial clue before your very eyes. Uh, don't tell me, let me see. Humans are sorry creatures, unable to see what's in front of their noses. Let me give you some assistance. Don't look, but observe me very closely. There is one particular feature about my purse that's changed. She knows in the end, I think. In the end. It's been stabbing me in both eyes right from the very beginning of our conversation. <laughs> I think we might need another clue before we uncover the full answer, Mr. Narhodo. Uh, thanks for the hint. I'll be tearing my hair out if the charade goes on much longer. Now, the lie you told. I think that's a bigger deal here. Mr. Sholmes, isn't about time you told us the truth. Just over a week ago, you said to us... I will now tell you something of the first importance, my dear fellow. Great detectives are wont to lie. It will serve you well to remember that. That case aboard the SS Borea in January. Cosmo wasn't killed, and you knew he wasn't dead at the time. So what was really going on? The fellow was unconscious for a very long time. If he hadn't regained conscious when he did, his life would have been in mortal peril. Of course, a side effect of the prolonged comatose state was amnesia, as you now know. It was a simple enough task to silence the crew. 
How? After they'd carried him out of the cabin, I assembled them in the lobby area. Then I made them swear to leave him unconscious and have him unloaded from the ship in Hong Kong as a murdered corpse. Oh, how horrible. It's necessary to find some material with which to persuade the crewmen to keep their word, of course. Uh, but why? Why do in the first place? I'll be at liberty to, uh, liberty to elaborate in due course. For the time being, I would like to reassure you. I didn't foresee the subsequent events. What events? His disappearance in Hong Kong. Oh. I believe I may have made a gross error of judgment. Mr. Sholmes. The mask caused him a war when he was assigned to Lord Van Zyke's apprentice. When he cast aside after the trial the other day, I just sort of picked it up. We have to give it back to him, I suppose. But he has his memory back now, doesn't he? I can't feel, help but feel he may turn around and tell me coldly to wear it myself. But uh, isn't he your best friend? My eyes always drawn to this big metal chest that Mr. Sholmes and Iris use as a coffee table. Is that why Iris keeps her very important papers? It is, so you'd think they'd treat it with more care, really. But only the other day I saw Mr. Sholmes kick it. Oh no. I suppose it must something must have been frustrating him. What a shame to mistreat the furniture, though. Was it damaged? Uh, the chest was fine, but Mr. Sholmes was doubled up on the floor for almost ten minutes. <laughs> oh dear. That's a painful tale. of November, Narahodo's Legal Consultation... Consultancy. The spade's still here, look. Please, Mr. Narahodo, it's not a spade, as I think you are well known. It is a shovel. Didn't take long to reignite that old argument. Ah, I have an idea. Let's give the implement a name, like Professor Hairbrain named his tools. Oh, I never thought of doing that. Now and then, let's call it Ryanosuke. No, 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 it's clearly much more of a Suzano. The old argument has taken a new and unexpected turn, as it seems. What to do? It's good news that Professor Mikataba arrives safely, isn't it? Yes, it's wonderful, and the fact that Father's been invited to his important international event really makes me proud to be his daughter. Your father, Judge Jiu Jigoku, us, and Cosmo, of course. There's an ever-increasing number of Japanese here in Britain's capital, isn't there? Well, yes, I suppose so. London does have a population of six million people, so I think we're still the minority. Suzato's father came here, who came here as a visiting student 16 years ago in Cosma. It's almost as if some great power has been at work, drawing them here across the ocean to London. And I feel as though the waters are starting to swell again now. Now, this is what we've been pushed to do for a while now. Ooh, I... 1st of November, British Supreme Court, Lord Chief Justice's office. Oh, dear. I imagine Lord Strongheart is boxing Von Zykes' ears right now for what he pulled. There's the final draft of the opening address for tomorrow's proceedings. I've supplemented your original with the figures you asked for from the yard. I see. Excellent work. Thank you. Oh, nice that his mouth is moving to help establish their... You're welcome, my lord. What's Lord Van Zykes doing here? My, there seems to be an awful lot of tension in the air, wouldn't you say? This place is stifling enough as it is. We really don't need any more tension. My apologies. I didn't notice you come in. Your small stature and dark dress make you all but invisible to me. 
Yeah, I've had, I think I mentioned from the start, this guy's giving me some rough vibes. It's great that he intends to modernize Britain and embrace the future, but we already know he's had his hand in a lot of different pies. And I don't think I want a slice of any one of them. Oh, no, no, it's uh, an entire mind wearing black shirt. From now on, you must dress in white from head to toe whenever you come here. Now then, Mr. Nar. Yes, my lord. I'm right here. Uh, kill me now. Is something wrong? Perhaps it is a little too hot in here for you. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, uh, I've never experienced a room with perfect temperature. Such perfect temperature. Well, for sure, the beads of sweat carving their way down your face seems to suggest otherwise. Because the daggers are staring at me with mainly. As you're no doubt aware, my International Forensic Science Symposium begins tomorrow. In fact, your father arrived in London earlier today, I hear, madam. Oh, yes, that's right, my lord. He's extremely honored to have been invited. I'll leave the remaining preparations of the meeting room in your capital ha capable hands in Lord Van Zyke's. I will attend at once. Give you a very cold stare as he left, didn't he? I know, but I haven't done anything, have I? Those past few days, my feet have barely touched the ground, I must say. My dedicated right hand of many years was recently put out of action in a spectacular fashion. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is your left hand still in service? Mr. Narahoto, he's talking about Dr. Scythe. Oh, yeah, it makes sense he wouldn't be aware of the that uh, figure of speech. I'm terribly sorry about that. I was just, um... Fair not. You've done nothing wrong. Dr. Scythe's own wrongdoing precipitated the situation. You needn't concern yourself with it any further. That would be a lot easier to do if it weren't for the piercing stare you're giving me. Lord Van Zyke's doing an admirable job of holding the fort. Though disturbingly, his apprentice has been missing since yesterday. Oh, missing? What's become of Cosmosama now? start with the missing apprentice. Um, about Lord Von Zyke's apprentice. Ah, yes, that came as a surprise to me, I must say. That you and he are old friends. How did he become an apprentice Lord Van Zyke's in the first place, anyway? It came about three months ago. An unidentified Asian man was apprehended by the border police. They found him hiding aboard a large goods vessel. Oh my, so he stowed away to get here. He had no papers to identify him. No passports, and he was suffering from amnesia on top of all that. Other than the fact he was clearly of Eastern descent, there were no clues to who he was. So I decided to sign him to Lord Van Zyke, so that way I could keep an eye on him. Oh, but then why the mask? I didn't want to burden Lord Van Zyke with tiresome explanations about why he had an Eastern apprentice. Oh, right, because Van Zyke um, is kind of a little racist. <gasps> Well, hopefully he's changing his mind now that he's seen that we care about the truth just like he does. And as we saw, for all of his negative traits, he does at least have a positive one in that he cares about the truth above everything else, including... And he's more than fine throwing his own racism out the window if it means he can get the truth. So it would be so much easier to explain why he was wearing a mask. He's proving to be a great help to Lord Van Zykes. I have high hopes for his future. Uh, by the way, do you know where he's gone? No idea, but I believe he's left London for the time being. Oh. I take it you also didn't know. The man's father was one of the country's most infamous criminals, I mean. Genshin. The forensic science. Let's start with the forensic science symposium then. Not long ago, visitor numbers of the Great Exhibition exceeded 30 million. 30 million? Are there even that many people in the world? As a comparison, Mr. Narahoto, the population of the Imperial capital Tokyo is 2 million. I'll be opening the International Forensic Science Symposium in the Exhibition's main auditorium. This event has been two years in the making, two years of preparations and negotiations with other countries. It sounds like a tremendous achievement. Congratulations! The 20th century will see the wholesale adoption of forensic investigation techniques, and cooperation between policing organizations around the globe will be essential, which is why... This landmark first symposium will be ho has to, had to be hosted here at the heart of a great British Empire. In order that Scotland Yard can become the leading investigative organization in the New World. 
He's the same as ever, I see. That passion of his is quite something. You're every bit as passionate in your own way, I'm sure, Mr. Narahodo. I'm the only person in this country who truly cares about the future that embraces forensic science. It was my intention to become a Majesty's Attorney General and reform the Yard from the ground up. So the disgrace of the forensic investigation team has been a bitter blow to my ambitions. I first established the forensic investigation team a year ago, experimentally to start with. With Dr. Scythe at the helm, it was steadily accruing an impressive record of achievement. I was on the verge of changing its name and elevating it to a full-blown forensic investigation department. And... Can you not do that, Niall? Obviously, nobody wants to hear anything about it at the moment. Even I can't keep the story out of the papers. Six million Londoners will be cursing forensic science now. This incident will set back our country's advancement in the field by a good ten years, I'd say. Unintended repercussions of our trial. We simply couldn't have overlooked what had happened, though. Of course not. We should all be grateful to you both. Anyways, I still reform this country's policing when I become Attorney General. This might delay my plans, but it will not alter them. Nothing will stand in my way. Cosmo's father's crimes. What we learned from the trial eight days ago was a huge shock. That my friend's father was... Ah, yes. Genshin Asogi. Professor Case ten years ago caused a great stir here in Britain. They were such awful murders and unprecedented. Using a ferocious dog as a murder weapon? And no one would have believed the culprit was a foreign student invited here to study about the government. So the true identity of the killer could not be made public then, and it can't be made public now. Nobody in our country knows it was him, and neither do the citizens of London. The main motivation was to avoid aggravating relations between our two nations at the time, I understand. Correct. However... It has been noted that there were some supporters of the professor's apparent cause. Wait, what? Supporters of a mass murderer? You see, the majority of the man's victims were a blight on the aristocracy of the day. Somewhat ironically, their deaths actually benefited society. Or so a fair few thinkers in London believed, anyway. Right, I see. But it was still murder, wasn't it? Yeah, they're scumbags, but... But, uh, murder is still an excessive way to deal with succumb bags. Too excessive. Far too excessive. Seems we're very similar, doesn't it? To the idea of the Reaper of Bailey. We've already asked him everything, and we don't have anything in the court records, so we need to go somewhere else. Are you sure we've asked everything we need to, Miss Naruto? So there's something else here we need to speak with him about. I do like this fireplace. It's one of the best things I've seen since we arrived in the country, in fact. Although, I do yearn for a Japanese kotatsu, putting your legs under a warm, blanketed table so comforting. Do be careful, Mr. Naruto. Don't mistakenly put your feet in the fire, will you? You'd suffer terrible burns, you know. I worry sometimes about how Sato sees me. This is Mr. Sholm's famous violin. The one he found being sold for a song at Pawn Brokery. What's it called? A shoddy... something? Oh yes, the wonderful instrument features the Adventures of Herlock... Featured in Adventures of Herlock Sholmes. It's a world-famous Stradivarius. Stradivarius, Mr. Naruto. Stragi, Stradivarius. Are you even trying now? We'll come back to this another time, I think. I finally managed to remember this behemoth's name. The Great Analytoscope. I don't think it was here when I left J for Japan, was it? Oh, is that right? Yes, because it was with the pawnbroker. Ah, uh, of course. Oh, that's giving me a wonderful idea. I could pawn everything that's on your desk. The office would be tidy at last. Don't even joke about that, Mrs. Otto. You are joking, aren't you?
There's all sorts on the shelves. Chemistry apparatus, books, papers, and uh, lots of things I've never seen before. It's all heaped up so high, I can't help feeling the whole lot of us is going to topple at any moment. Because though it might topple, yet it doesn't. The epitome of Mr. Sholmes' brilliance. I don't get it. As it happens, I'm actually quite well practiced when it comes to stacking shelves myself. Just the other day, the shelf in my office finally gave way under the strain, though. It's as though it might topple, and it does. Yes, the epitome of your disarray. I really don't get it. I can't ask Sholmes about his hair for some reason. That's Iris's wonderful collection of medicines, potions, and chemicals. Just look at all the little bottles she's squeezing the shelves. Yeah, and there are charming little ribbons tied around the bottles as well. But the labels aren't quite so charming, are they? This one here reads, Deadly Poison! Oh, I've been so excited about the idea of helping Iris with her experiments, you know? Just try to avoid any bottles labeled Deadly Poison or Highly Explosive. <laughs> ah, yes, Mr. Sholm's cl curious collection of trinkets from the mystery various mysteries he solved. It's one of my favorite parts of this room, full of items with such exciting tales to tell. And I do believe he's added to it since I last looked. Now there's a mysterious... Prince, the prince is. A mysterious little box, a mysterious horseshoe, a mysterious biscuit. I think that last one might just be one of Iris's unfinished... Snacks. I can't ask him about his hair for some reason. Just sitting behind that desk must make you feel so important, don't you think? Would you like to have an office like this, Mr. Naruhoto? With such a grand desk? Who, me? No, I don't think so. Oh? Well, imagine if you suddenly found yourself needing the toilet. You have so far to go. How true. Perhaps the important people work in ostentious offices like this haven't considered such things. I'm gonna take that as a compliment. You couldn't read all these books, even if you were reincarnated six times over as a bookworm. Can Lord Strongheart really have read all these? Thinking about it, Father studies full of books that look as though they've never been read, too. Well, really. Headlers of books are forever pushing their wares in him, you see. And I think he's just too kind-hearted to refuse them. There's a phrase for that in Britain. People would say they saw him coming. It makes me wonder perhaps the vast number of books on the shelves in here are a sign of Lord Strongheart's overwhelming kind-heartedness. I'm not sure you could afford to have a kind heart if you had to keep Lord Van Zykes in line, could you? So nervous here. I'd love to ask if I could borrow some books, but I just can't. Are you sure we've asked everything we need to, Miss Naruhoda? Well, there's nothing to be doing in the luxurious atmosphere. I know it's only an alley room, but I find this place more relaxing than anywhere else. I don't have anything I can present. Um, Mr. Sholm was about this. Tell me, Miss Naruhoda, is this the first time you've shown me this particular trinket? Uh, I don't really remember, to be honest. If my saying that it's a colorful breed of miniature canine with a particularly long neck were to precipitate a here we go again from your lips, we could be sure it was not the first time. Duction, you see, my dear fellow. Duction. And once again, he overthought it. Um, could I show you this, Lord Strongheart? I'm the Lord Chief Justice. I'm not here to offer advice about evidence. Especially when the evidence in question is so dull. Oh, so that's a real reason.
So what do I need to do to make the option where he explains his hair show up? Dang, I'm getting stuck on the investigation phase. Dang. Starting to swell again now. Room across the hall. Room across the hall is undisturbed, of course. I don't suppose to be permitted to see inside now that you're back, though, would I? You know very well the only iris is allowed inside. Yeah, I heard you two giggling together in there again last night. You can visit Mr. Sholmes in his room. Last time I did that, he tried to convince me to drink some strange concoction he mixed up. All still winking at me. Look, I wonder when he'll finally get his other eye filled in. Yes, I wonder. Well, you should know, Suzado. I entrusted the task to you. But the truth is, I've already decided when that will be. Really? When? That's my little secret. Nothing particular of note. Why aren't we allowed to ask him about his hair? Correctly, this large and imposing lump of iron is a typewriter. I think that every single one of the adventures of Herlock Sholm has blossomed from this very machine. Ah, it's such a dreamy thought. I actually had a go on it the other day. The metal bars that move when you hit the keys got all tangled up somehow, and that made Iris angry. Mr. Narahodo, you're ruining my dreamy thoughts. Please don't do that again. Uh, now I've made Suzato angry as well. Iris' pretty little tea set is out as, set out as beautifully as ever. Well, it's only by carefully taking care of a tea set that you can make good tea. Is that a roundabout way of telling me I need to tidy up my desk? Oh, Miss Narahoto, you do overthink things at times. As the puppy sings, something or other trying to get my attention. Come on. Uh, one moment, please.
Uh, sorry about that. Let's see here. Alright, so she said we need to find another clue before we can do that. Hmm. Alright, let's examine here, finding what... Ah, the newspaper. This looks like last week's edition. And what's the article circled in red ink here? It's an advertisement column. It says, uh, to the Red-Headed League. Red-Headed League? What's that? I don't know. I've never heard of it before, but... It is something on my face. Clearly, this is something to do with that lively hair. Red-Headed League article seems somewhat suspicious in nature. Let's see here. Get four a week if you are a redhead. Most fantastical money-making opportunity. Red-Headed League, on account of the... Uh, Guest of the late Ezekiel Hopkins of well, PA USA. There's now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the league to a salary of four pounds per week for purely nominal services. Alright, so this is what we gotta present. It looks as though someone circled an advertisement in the paper, Mr. Sholmes. To the Red-Headed League. Hmm. Does that strike you in some way? I was thinking that just maybe it might be related to your bright red hair. <laughs> so, at last you've learned to apply my methods, Mr. Naruhoto. I'm... I'm sorry. In this first instance, and quite indispensable, observation! Oh, believe me, I could've seen that hair with my eyes shut. So then, allow me to regale you with the t details of my latest exploits. Regale or boast? So what is this red-headed league, which seems to be the subject of this advertisement you circled? You noticed in the paper, then. That, my dear fellow, was going to be the source of this month's rent payment. Rent payment. It was how. According to the advertisement, the Redhead League is a distinguished institution of fellows of unspecified governance. In fact, the only condition for becoming a member is having red hair. That uh, doesn't seem entirely that doesn't entirely surprise me. But listen to what the lucky redheads receive once they join. An unconditional salary of four pounds a week. Oh my, four pounds a week? But why? What are they paying people for? That I don't know. No details are given in the advertisement. Surely every redhead person in the country is going to be flocking to join in that case. You're right. There's no time to lose. I'll put my application at once. So will I, just uh, on the off chance. That might be stretching a point, I think. The trouble is, they have a fixed number of members, you see. Oh, I see. So once a certain number of people have joined, no one else can. But as luck would have it, one member recently passed away. It wasn't particularly lucky for the redhead in question, I feel, Mr. Sholmes. So you decided to try and join this place? Correct. I mean, look at me. Have you ever seen such a redheaded fellow? Um, no. So why? Why did it have to go so wrong? Uh, what on earth happened? A blunder, Mr. Arodo, though it pains me to admit it. Your blunder. What did you actually do to your hair, Mr. Sholmes? I'm glad you asked, Miss Suzato. What do you see atop my head is neither dyed nor a hairpiece. I changed the color of my hair overnight. By the wonders of chemistry. A chemistry? I was conducting some research into a method of rejuvenating spent tea leaves. And over the course of my work, I stumbled upon a potion that when taken turns one's hair a flame like red. Would you like to try it? It'll make every hair on your body perfectly crimson. I, uh, think I'll pass. But Mr. Sholmes, is it quite safe to drink? Surely it's bad for you, isn't it? <laughs> Amateurs are always hampered by such fears. Oh, I never should have doubted you, Mr. Sholmes. You mean to say? But of course. 
to earn four pounds per week, one must be prepared to turn a blind eye to a little danger. That degree of red signals more than just a little danger, surely. So anyway, Hurley left full of confidence yesterday with his new red hair. On well, the park on Lime Street, where the Redhead League were interviewing prospective new members. So, what went wrong? The whole park was choked with red-headed folk, like a coaster's orange borrow. I queued for eight hours solid before at last I reached the front. When the panel of interviewers saw me, they immediately said, Ah, oh, Ms. Rolex Holmes, are you in disguise to conduct an investigation? So naturally, I had no choice but to reply, oh, Shh, don't give me away. After which, I could do little else but turn and leave. And this morning, when I looked in the mirror, irritation stirred within me. So I turned that pair into the police. Oh dear, what a disaster. For Hurley and those two redheads. Ring, ring. Ah, here's my guest now, my latest client, with money to spend. Oh, I do hope it's an exciting case, Hurley. Remember, Iris, we are at present gripped by the greatest problem known to man. I must be willing to accept any case, no matter how unstimulating, save locating a runaway, of course. Uh, don't spare anyone's feelings, will you? Oh dear, I'm afraid Hurley can act a little tact, especially just before rent is due. Whack. Mr. Sholmes, Herlock Sholmes, please, oh, please. It's not my husband, he's run away. I suppose you did curse it, Mr. Sholmes. To upset me. I beg your pardon? Uh, never mind, a personal matter. My apologies. What exactly are you trying to say, Mr. Narahodo? I didn't say a word. Come, my dear madam, be seated. I risk some tea, if you please. Of course. Of course. Yeah, that's a jur. What's the matter? That's a jur. What's the matter, Mrs. Otto? Oh, it's just that gentlewoman. I feel sure I've seen her somewhere before. And very recently at that. Yes, now that you mention it, she was juror number two in last trial. As I explained earlier, my name is E. Evie Vigil. I implore you to take the case, sir. Money's no object, simply name your figure. Money and wealth of little consequence to me, madam. Being offered a case to solve is reward enough. Oh, Mr. Sean, to the picture of benevolence. I will, of course, make a mental note of your offer, however, for contingent reasons. I trust you'll remember your words also. Um, if I might inquire, sir, uh, this gentleman lady would be... Oh, uh, me? Uh, what am I about to tell you? I should like to communicate in the strictest confidence, you understand? Ah, uh, these are my friends. I assure you, they may s say before this pair anything that you may say to me. Ah, uh, I see. I can vouch for the gentleman personally, after all. He's hard of hearing. Why did I ever get my hopes up? <laughs> Let's ask her about herself. Uh, forgive me for asking, Miss Vigil, but... Mrs. Vigil, but have we met somewhere before? Quite recently, perhaps? Oh my. Shaw, my dear fellow, what's your intention? Clearly you have no ability to differentiate the facial features of the... <laughs> If you wish to invite Lady T, you must do so in a more gentlemanly fashion. Is it possible? You are the nice young lawyer from the trial I attended last week. Ah, I knew I recognized her. Love a man's fate in the palm of one's hand. Oh gosh, oh golly, it's in shivers down my spine. I didn't quite recognize her because she act she's acting so differently now. It must be difficult for you as a lawyer, being a hot of hearing, I mean. Uh, pardon? Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I, don't worry if you can't hear. I was, uh, I was... Oh, no, there's nothing more. Now look what you started, Mr. Sholmes. Thank you very much. I do believe it would be prudent of you to sit quietly in the corner. Yes. Let's ask about Mr. Vigil here. Uh, tell us about your husband, ma'am. Husband. Mr. Vigil, my daily... Daily Vigil? Is 40 years of age. I have a photograph here. An entirely unremarkable gentleman, by appearance at least. How long have you been married? It'll be 15 years this year. 
We have a cordial relationship, but my husband's income is more than adequate that we live comfortably. As it would appear, I need only look at you to know these things. Oh gosh. Your dress is the latest style, your hat clearly regularly groomed, and your eyes are animated. In short, you have no inkling as to why your husband might have disappeared, correct? That's right, he's a kind man with a strong sense of loyalty, loyalty, any other dotes on me. Which would point to the possibility that he has become embroiled in some incident or other. Ooh, that's exactly what I fear might have happened, Mr. Sholmes. I'm quite beside myself. My husband's employment is somewhat unusual, you see. What if he's incurred some miscreant's ill will? What exactly is your husband's line of work? He's a warder at the prison. A prison guard. That is somewhat unusual, I suppose. Uh, so, to the matter of your husband's disappearance. When did you realize he was missing? Please try not to laugh. It was yesterday. I'm sorry, yesterday? Oh my, that really is recently. Laughably so. The truth is, my husband does at times on occasion spend the night away for his work. It's not out of the ordinary for him to not return at home at night, but this is different. We do not make any contact for a whole day. This has really never happened before. Oh my dear Daly, what could ever have happened? My dear Miss Vigil, please calm yourself. Now then, have you contacted the police? Why naturally, but sadly, they refuse to listen to my pleas as my husband has only been missing for a day. I was asked to wait patiently at home. Hmm. Hmm. In truth, Miss Vigil, I do concur with the police. Uh, however, let's not be so hasty. There's no reason why I should not engage my deductive powers to track your husband down anyway. Oh, thank you, Mr. Sholmes. Furthermore, let me assure you, a chance to solve the greatest problem known to man for another month that has no bearing on my decision. I seek only put a sweet smile on the Londoner's face. That's really all there is to it. But my eternal gratitude! I shall pay any care some you care to mention. I seek only put the sweet's rent in your landlady's purse. That's all there is to it. <laughs> so, your husband's a prison warder. That's right, yes. Well, in actual fact, he's the chief warder. Indeed, I see. Well, chief prison warder certainly qualifies as something as a specialist occupation. Yes, it does indeed. My poor husband must prepare those dreadful punishments and see that they're carried out. Dreadful punishments. Does she mean capital punishments? Oh, at such times, he must occasionally spend a night or two at the prison dormitory. With extra responsibility, he is remunerated more handsomely than the other warders. Of course, we make no mention of my husband's work to the neighbors. Yes, I believe your prudence is justified. Tell me, at what prison is your husband engaged? A Barclay prison, Mr. Sholmes. Really, Barclay? Oh, what a fine establishment. If I'm not mistaken, there's a large cemetery just behind it. Uh, yes, that's correct. Lowgate Cemetery. No. Lowgate Cemetery. The very place we were discussing in court. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable, my dear fellow. And yet undeniable. I'm sorry, Mr. Sholmes. I'm afraid you've lost me. Ah, uh, pay no heed, madam. Pay no heed. A private matter. This can't really be a coincidence, can it? Thank you for everything you've shared with us, Ms. Vigil. Mrs. Vigil, I believe I have all the information I need now to begin my investigation. Oh, please report to me with some good news, sir. Fair not, madam. In a day or two, I shall be contacting you with a heartening report, I'm quite sure. So soon? How splendid, Mr. Sholmes. Good news should be delivered early, I always say. Would you be so kind as to leave the photograph of your husband in my possession? Thank you. Now allow me to show you the door. I can't thank you enough, Mr. Sholmes. You've been simply marvelous. You know, I think every time hurly. How do you come out with such nonsense? Good news in a day or two? Are you sure? 
I can't be sure, of course, but I didn't, then again, I didn't swear on it. I merely gave the good woman some hope. I hope to be able to give her good news, one might say. After all, the rent must be paid by the end of the day tomorrow. But if by that time I've successfully located Mr. Vigil, we shall be mutually relieved. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Narahodo? Don't look at me with those pleading eyes. Well, my dear fellow, did you hear the details of the case? Yes, my hearing is surprisingly good, actually. Excellent. And what do you make of it? Well, I was surprised to learn that her, where her husband worked, at Barclay Prison, I mean. Ah, so you noted that. Of course, especially with the mention of Lowgate Cemetery. Lowgate Cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. So it was renowned among us students at the university for being haunted by ghosts of condemned convicts. Barclay Prison is where the notorious man was incarcerated, the Professor. And now a warder from the prison has mysteriously disappeared, it would seem. It's all very peculiar. Indeed, but nothing you can't handle, I'm quite certain, Mr. Narahodo. Sorry. We're along the prison, see what you can glean, wouldn't you? It's a prison governor you want. No doubt the man is equally worried. Oh, aren't you going to go yourself? Surely you needn't ask. I can't possibly be seen out with this hair. <laughs> uh, but didn't you go to Lime Street with that hair? That was quite a different matter. So I leave in your capable hands. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm rather busy. Of course you are. Barclay Prison on the outskirts of London back into a lonely burial ground. Its four high outer walls loomed quietly before us in the fog. Having requested a meeting, we were shown to the governor's office in the watchtower. Oh my. That's a lot of weapons. And... 1st of November, Barclay Prison Governor's Office. And that guillotine clock is most definitely a sick joke. The dude must really, really love dark humor. This place is full of hardened criminals like Kenneth. <clears throat> this place is full of hardened criminals like Kenneth. I remember the last time a civilian was doing here. And you didn't uh, walk... D talk to an inmate, but to me. Do you, you know who I am? I'm Governor Barry Caden, hmm? Oh, yes, it's a pleasure. I'm Rhinosuke Narahodo, defense lawyer. And an Easterner, I see. Does that mean? Uh, yes, I'm a visiting student of law from the Empire of Japan. Japan, did you see? Japan! Um, yes. Well, there's no one kind of here, laddie. Hey, maybe you should try the prison next door, eh? I didn't notice another prison next door, sir. Anyway, we came to ask you some questions about... I didn't like to be so direct, but... I have no intention of speaking with likes so of your special organization. Now get to of my editor. Kaden was also mentioned by name in the last case, if I remember. As soon as he finds out we're from Japan, he acts like this. This surely means... I think it's because of the Professor case. I think so too. Ten years ago, Genshin Asogi, also known as the Professor, was incarcerated at this prison. And then after his execution, he apparently re-emerged from his grave in the cemetery behind the prison. I... I might have known. You're sniffing around about the case, aren't you? Your agent's a part of the Professor's great web, no doubt. No, we're just... Get on with ya! I punch your light and shoot. Oh, fine. Clearly the ghost of that killer still haunts this place. We're not gonna get anywhere here. Unless we can prove this man, there's nothing suspicious about us. Governor Caden. What are you thinking, Mrs. Otto? I feel that name came up in conversation recently somewhere. I wonder if we ever mentioned it might be have some ideas to help us. Come to think of it, I have the same feeling. Well, the Lord Chief Justice will certainly can certainly give us permission to speak there.
Okay, so he doesn't have anything to react to this. I said get old. It won't even let me examine it. I don't believe Governor Caden will speak to us at the moment. In oh, I don't know. Ah, he's here. That's Professor Mikatab over there. Ah, hello you two. I was just taking a moment to catch up with the world now that I'm unpacked. But where is Judge Jigoku? Ah, he's not the relaxing sword. He's taking himself off to pay his respects to all the legal bigwigs. Haven't we just arrived in the country today? Goodness, he's full of energy. Uh, Professor, you mentioned something before about how you'd known the prison governor at Barclay Prison. Oh, Governor Caden, you mean. So it was the same man. Oh, I thought it was from the previous case, but no, it was here. Father, we must speak with the governor. But he refused to talk to with us. He said we were suspicious Easterners. Well, I'm sure if I accompanied you, it would be a very different story. Oh, would you? That would be wonderful. Do you have time now? Well, sadly, as you can see, I'm very busy at the moment. Busy drinking coffee on a comfortable settee. Oh, now I have rather a lot to prepare for tomorrow, you know. Oh, sorry. I didn't say that out loud, did I? Yumikatabas are alarmingly good at reading people's thoughts. Or could it be you Narodos are alarmingly bad at hiding your thoughts? Well, it's not Fallout now. I have an idea. What's he writing on that piece of paper? Here's a letter of introduction for you. Hopefully when he sees my name, he'll change his tune. Ah, thank you. A note of introduction on our behalf from Professor Mikataba to Governor Caden. Hopefully now he'll be willing to talk to us. Good luck then. Professor Mikataba has wonderful handwriting, doesn't he? This dark suited young man is not in the least bit untrustworthy. Is it just me, or does that make me sound extremely untrustworthy? I do wish he at least called you a nice young man. I'm really not sure that would help. Oh, this looks like some sort of steamship ticket. The SS Gross. First Class Cabin 01. Yokohama, Yogama departure 11th of September. London arrival 1st of November. Ah, that's the boat the Professor Mikitaba and Judge Jigoku came from on Japan, isn't it? Yes, I think it's called at Dunkirk on the north coast of France for a night for arriving in Dover. I think it's been almost a year since we arrived in Dover on the SS Boria. It seems a shame not to keep your ticket as a memento of your trip, don't you think? Yes, I agree. I have mine safely in my diary. And I keep mine in my wallet so I have it with me at all times. Oh, strange. Where could have gone? I didn't like this on purpose, Mr. Narahodo. Did I imagine it, or was that comment accompanied by a little sigh? Uh, if you catch your eyes over this, Governor Caden. What's this? Can I pull the world of my eyes? Nothing Japanese students. Mikotaba. That? That young dog from the forensic laboratory. That Mikotaba. Yes, exactly him. Oh dear, perhaps I should have said something sooner. I'm Eugene Mikotaba's daughter, Shizato. Oh, you're the young man's daughter. And you didn't think I mentioned that before. I do apologize. I well, you best take a seat then. Can I offer you a couple deep wraps? Did I? And did I forget to uh, try one of the wee handcuff biscuits? Your father's influence is nothing short of amazing. 
I am bitterly regretting not announcing who I was from the outset now. So then what can I do for you then? Well, we're currently investigating a case. It's one of your warders, you see. He's gone missing. Missing? That's right. It's surely been reported to you as well, being the prison governor. I have heard nothing of the sort. There's no missing persons in my prison. Oh, but how can that be? It's Mr. Daily Vigil, your chief warder. Hey, Vigil. That's right, his wife came to us and asked us to investigate his disappearance. Let's skip to the part about him only going missing yesterday for now. Clearly that means something to him. Would you be so kind as to tell us what you know, sir? Aye, aye, of course. Well, let's examine here, because I absolutely want to look at this clock. This, uh, grandfather clock is, uh, is fitted with a terrifying blade that keeps dropping down. It's modeled on the guillotine, a French execution device. You might have heard of it. Yeah, and before you ask, it can chop heads off, I mean. Uh, have those no carrots and parsnips and so forth. Okay, so it's only, it's um, only designed to cut food. It's not designed for actual people. If you place a large carrot at the bottom there in the morn, by evening it'll have been cut clean in two. Oh, so it takes forever. Oh, the blade must have had an almost indescribable edge on it then. An axe, a hunting rifle, four pairs of handcuffs. That's a daunting collection. Ah, there's a stored behind every one of those. Oh, you mean the rifle is a famous killer's murder weapon? The axe wielded by the famous executioner? And the handcuffs were to mobilize a fierce four-legged beast when it was arrested? I think you're in the realms of fantasy now, Mr. Narahodo. Ah, know those kinds of stories, Jimmy. That axe was the one I used to chop down the cherry tree at my house. Mrs. Gaiden was the best pleased. Cuffs on the left are the ones I caught my first burglar with back when I was a bobby. But the stories were a little different to those you imagined, I think, weren't they? Yes, to my relief. And in some small way, my disappointment. <laughs> I've never expected to find a parrot in prison. Must be the governor's pet. Given where we are, it's hard not to see the poor creature as a prisoner. You don't you didn't kill me. Ah. Has, uh, has the bird learned to mimic uh, the plaintive cries of inmates in cells? Oh no, he is one of three siblings, you see. He still cools out the names of his brothers like that all the time. Right. Let me out. Did that kill me? Aye, aye, I hear ya, laddie. You want your dinner, eh? Didn't I do it? That reminds me of a silly dark joke. Not too dark, mind you. A burglar breaks into a person's house, who's, um, and some cries out, Jesus is watching you. Now he looks around and can't find anyone, Then, but then later he hears again, Jesus is watching you. So he turns around and sees a parrot, and he's all, wait, who the hell are you? And the parrot's all, Moses. He's all, what kind of stupid people would name a parrot Moses? And the parrot's, says, probably the same people that name their Rottweiler Jesus. It's a very large cabinet full of papers, isn't it? It's labeled Inmate Register. Look, and all the files are in alphabetical order. That's 50 years worth of records at Parkley's inmates. Whether or no they left alive after serving their term. All the details of both the crimes they committed are recorded in there as well, like an epitaph, one might say. A record of crimes and punishments. How dispiriting. And yet... This man seems to be enjoying the tea and biscuits as he talks about it. Well, it takes all kinds. I suppose these are all the former governors of Barclay Prison, are they? Either that or former inmates the governor has sent to the gallows. And, oh dear, they all have such severe expressions. I really couldn't deny either possibility. Especially the one on the extreme right. His expression goes beyond severe into a whole new territory. Uh, that one's me. Ah, I I'm terribly sorry, sir. Is it a prerequisite of the job, perhaps? Having a severe expression, I mean?
Of course it's not. Although, uh, it is taken into consideration. A lot. <laughs> Now let's ask about Professor Mikutaba first. <laughs> My father came to Britain all those years ago in order to study forensic medicine. You seem to have been well acquainted. The dead room, the prison, and the cemetery have a lot to do with one another. After all, they need fresh corpses for the forensic research. Do you again? Yeah, I can imagine. The advancement of medical science isn't always particularly palatable. Your father worked in the laboratory just on the far side of the graveyard, in the basement of St. Sinners. It's still in use today. St. Sinners? That's come up before, I'm sure. Yes, that's right. We've been there. Big Gutabo and I have. So you still ride and carry together and negotiate terms. For fresh material, I suppose. I and we used to sit there for hours to gabble on about a boot dissection sorts. Ooh, that takes me back. Over a pot of deer and a plate of cuffed biscuits, of course. How charming. Can't get much more British than teen biscuits. He was a good fellow, your father. Reliable and dead set on his work. I'm afraid. I'll never understand you, Japanese. Because of Genshin and Sogi, I suppose. We understand that Mr. Vigil is the chief warder here at the prison. Aye, that he was. Strong sense of responsibility and dedicated the job. No doubt about it. About it. He was a fine warder. Uh, sorry, did you say was? Aye. Doesn't even work here no more. He left the job. Oh my! It, where, when was this exactly? Now that a question. When was it about? Can I have been much less than, uh... Ten years ago now. What? Ten years ago? He stopped working ten years ago? I, as I mind it. You again, I haven't heard of the fellow's name all this time. I so worry if he's gone missing, though. Ms. Vigil, Mrs. Vigil made no mention of it. I think perhaps, Mr. Naruhodo, that his wife simply doesn't know. I think she's unaware that he no longer works here. Governor Caden, can you tell us what happened? Oh, why did he give up his job here? That's uh, important, is it? It happened at the same time as the Professor case, so yes, I believe it might be. What are you thinking, Mr. Naruhodo? I can't help wondering, given that it was ten years ago... Ah, which was exactly when the Professor was being held at the prison. Yeah, I knew we were going to find out the truth behind that before all this was said and done. So Mr. Vigil actually resigned from the position of Chief Warder ten years ago, you're telling us. What happened to make him leave the job? In actual fact, he didn't leave the job willingly. He had no choice in the matter. You mean he was fired? He was dismissed? It was after a particular walk. I'm sorry, a walk? I that's our word for it in here. A walk to the gallows. An execution. It's a job of the chief warder to prepare the gallows tree and oversee any executions, you see. Only uh, Vigil did something unthinkable on that last walk the mat he was manning. What did he do? I'm sorry, but I cannot reveal that information. I can tell you it's very rare for a chief warder to be relieved of his post. But why wouldn't Mrs. Vigil know about it? She appears to be under the impression that her husband still works here. I wouldn't again know anything about that, I'm afraid. Can you perhaps answer one more question about the circumstance of his dismissal? And what would that be in? The last execution Mr. Vigil was responsible for overseeing. Was it by any chance the professor's? My thoughts exactly. I'm sorry, I really am. But I'm not at liberty to answer that. I see. Well, the fact he refuses to answer it means, yes, it is. Well... I cannot tell you anything else. Thank you so much for your time, Governor. Oh, one moment to forward it away, Hen. I'm sure I have it here somewhere. 
Ah, found it. Here, take this as we souvenir of visit to the prison. Uh, what is it? That's Vis Mi That's Va Jill's dismissal notice. It's ten years old now, of course. So basically, it's pink slip. I. It's no trouble at all. It's not the original mind. Okay, so yeah, they made copies of it, and that's why he's willing to give it to us. Thank you very much, Governor Caden. Well, in return... Do me a favor and never come back here. That case is closed. Well, I think we ought to return to Baker Street for the time being. Yes, I agree. We need to report back to Mr. Scholz what we found out. What will he tell Mrs. Vigil, I wonder? Obviously, we need to like, look up, take a look at this. A harsh reprimand incurred by Mr. Vigil ten years ago, resulting in losing his job. The 25th of June. That date's going to be important. Chief Warder Daily Vigil is relieved of his post with immediate effect, having violated Clause 132 of Her Majesty's Code of Conduct for Prisons. All rights to redundancy pay and other financial benefits are fully revoked. We're obviously going to have to figure out what that is. Aiding and abetting this reason for dismissal, aiding and abetting the escape from this prison of convicts prior to his execution. Details are still being investigated. Full cooperation with inquiries will be expected. Oh, so that's why his execution was faked and he was going to be... Maybe he was one of the people who agreed with what he was doing. Additional notes. Indications are are that the jailbreak plot was conceived prior to the convict's incarceration. It's believed the convict engaged some form of negotiation with prison staff to secure assistance. Full disclosure of information regarding these will be demanded. First of November. Sholmes is sweet. We're back. Hello, you two. I thought you'd be back before long, so I baked some scones for us all. Ah, so that's what the delicious smell is. Greetings, my dear fellows. What the crap? You've returned a good deal sooner than I was anticipating. Um, hello, Mr. Sholmes. Uh, hello, Mr. Sholmes. Blue hair. Say nothing, your thoughts are written all over your faces in, in any case. Well, if this whole detective gig doesn't work out, you could probably make a good Fire Emblem protagonist. Your hair is certainly the right color now. Turns out that it may have been advisable to test my hair color restoration tonic before application. Oh my. Pray tell me, what of our warder friend? Have you garnered some new information? Oh, um, yes, actually. Something very surprising, in fact. Though it's not a patch on your hair, to be honest. It most certainly isn't, but still, we discovered that... Sean... Drop everything, Sholmes. This is more important. Gina? I can't... Adam and Eve it. What does that mean? She can't believe it, or... What's happened? Clearly a very grave matter indeed. For Miss Lestrade made no mention of my hair whatsoever. True, she'd normally make... No... It's... it's the boss. What do you mean? Inspector Gregson? Where the boss is, he's... he's dead! What? They... they just found his body. Shot with a pistol. What? But... but... Inspector Gregson! He was... murdered? No, not Gregsy. Come in, my dear girl. Tell us the whole story. <laughs> the inspector's death. Are you serious, Jeaner? <gasps> Inspector Gregson was... Oh no, poor Bob Belcher. He was really shot. I don't know much about what happened myself yet. They're still there, investigating the scene. Where did this take place? A little went in a building full of flats on the Fresno Street. The outskirts of town. Nowhere near his home. He was perhaps investigating a case then. The thing is, uh, no one at the yard knows nothing about no case around there. 
Oh, how strange. Oh, boss, you was so good to me. I know it ain't up to much yet, but... One day I was gonna show him, I was gonna show him how to become a proper detective. Oh, genie. Culprit. Uh, who did this? Do you have any idea who the culprit is? Uh, they got him already. Already? They've caught the shooter so soon? Oh, witness word something was going on, and the boys got straight down there and took care of him. Who? What off person did this? Oh, no, it was. I still can't believe it myself. Gina? It was the Reaper. Wait, I thought it was going to be Judge Jogoku, but... It's Von Zykes? Wait a minute, you don't mean... They've arrested Lord Van Zykes for it. That's right. Uh, the Reaper bloke's gone and shot the boss. No, Lord Van Zykes. Are you quite sure, Mr. Strahd? It's Barak Von... Are you quite sure, Mr. Strahd, that it's Barak Von Zykes the police have arrested? I saw him with my own eyes in the interview room at the yard. I don't believe it. But there were witnesses, and they're all saying it was him. So you mean, there were actually multiple witnesses? They heard the gunshot, apparently. And when our lock was the scene, there was only the boss and that Reaper bloke in the room. But there's no way but Lord Van Zykes would have taken Gregson's life. I just don't believe it. I don't believe it either. Thank you for informing us, Miss Lestrade. This is really most terrible news. I'm dreadfully sorry. What are you saying sorry for? You didn't do nothing. I think my condolences would have been a lot better, Mr. Sholmes. Well, anyway, I'm taking a cab over the scene right now. Please come at all, as soon as you can. You gotta help. It's a detective's lot to appear whenever some, whenever, wherever some sinister plot unfolded. Little wonder we all look so haggard. Sometimes these things are almost too much for the nerves. Mr. Sholmes? Why use there being a great detective if I fail to see something like this coming? How could I let this happen to Gregson? To Gregson? Dang. Mr. Naruhoto, I shall leave at once to begin my investigations. Of course, yes, we will too. It would be helpful if you could talk to Mr. Reaper and see what you can glean. I'm sure you were intending to do so anyway. Until later, then. <laughs> Inspector Gregson, dead. And Lord Van Zykes arrested. Runo, Susie. I've called you a handsome. It's waiting outside. Thank you, Iris. Shall we, Miss Suzato? Yes. New location's been added. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the Fresno Street Room first. First of November, room on Fresno Street. This really is an out-of-the-way part of London. I doubt many people find their way down to this black street. So this dust-ridden, rented old room is where it happened, then. So, this is where the poor Inspector Gregson lost his life? Yes. The police are already hard at work investigating, it seems. I don't see Mr. Sholmes anywhere, though. Perhaps his investigations have taken him elsewhere. Boy, what do you think you're doing there? Even one of the drawers has to be taken right out so we can look underneath them all. I want the space above the ceiling check. Don't forget to look inside the chimney stack, too. Blow me. Ain't you a lot ever go over hours looking for dough when its owner's out of town? Gina obviously has some unique investigative techniques she wants everyone to adopt. Well, well uh, if you want to know a good way to break in, uh, and asking someone who has experience would definitely be a good way to do it. 
Oh, so you've turned up at last. Mind you, I ain't been here long myself. Hello again, Gina. She almost only just left. You're lucky I missed that. He went prancing around in the air, pointing at stuff and... and uh, bickering at that as... then just scarpered. Oh, he finished investigating already, you mean? Yeah, he didn't stop saying nothing to no one, not even me. Oh, Gina, would you mind if we investigated too? Uh, listen, Odo. You're a lawyer, right? Um, yes. Why? Well, you're not thinking of trying to help out the Reaper, are you? Oh, poor Gina. She's never gonna forget, is she? That trial will haunt her forever. Gina, if you don't mind me saying, if Lord Van Zyke's really is responsible for this crime, he'll be duly and fairly judged in court. I suppose you're right, yeah. Go on then, Odo. Get investigating. I want to know the truth about what really happened here. Thank you, Gina. And I think this will be a good time to call the stream. Alright. Thank you for watching. Hope you had a good time. I saved my VODs for as long as Twitch allows, so if you ever need them, they'll be there. Or if you want to see some of my older VODs, so I have been continuing to upload to my YouTube account. You can uh, find the link to it in my About page. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.